Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Jim Sweet. I'm the chair of the history department. Uh, I'm just going to give a few brief comments, mostly thank yous to our many sponsors. Um, and then I will hand it off to my colleague, Catherine Sianzi, to do the proper introductions. Um, we have three, in addition to the history department, there are three major sponsors for, for this talk. Um, the Center for Jewish Studies, the Lubar Institute for the Study of Abrahamic Religions, and the Center for Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia, or better known as Krika in these parts. Um, we're really pleased that we had so much cross-campus support for the lecture. Um, but the real impetus for this, the real sort of um, um, inspiration for this lecture was, did not come from the campus itself, but rather came from the outside. Uh, indeed, the idea for the lecture came from Michael Kaplan, uh, whose engagement with the history department goes back many, many years. Um, my first contact with, with Michael was uh, about a year and a half ago, right when I became chair. I, um, I learned as, as I came into the office that he had um, offered a bequest to the department, and um, I phoned him. Uh, he lives in Portland, Oregon. I picked up the phone, and this is the first one of these calls I had made, so I was a little bit um, nervous. It's sort of like picking up the phone to make a call to, for that first date, you know? I was, <laughs> I was um, uneasy. And uh, I, so I called, and on the other end of the phone was someone who was very calm and generous and thankful to hear from me. I was surprised. I was expecting, you know, I felt like a telemarketer, actually. Uh, uh, but, it, you know, what, what I found was, and, and this is something I found over and over again since that time, that when, when we reach out to our alums, they're, they're always generous. They're always happy to hear from us. And they always have stories about, about what they learned and who influenced them while they were here. And in Michael's case, we ended up having a 30 or 40 minute conversation about the influence that George Mossy in particular had on him while he was here. Uh, and the one thing that stands out for me in that conversation was that, um, you know, Michael told me a little bit about his own sort of professional trajectory and said, you know, that he had gone into uh, to counseling and psychology. Um, but he said the one thing that I, he took away most strongly from, from Mossy's courses in history was, um, was not to be impulsive, to be thoughtful, to be reflective, to, to consider the evidence before you, before you make any quick decisions. And he said it influenced his professional life as a psychologist. And it was the first time as chair where I was thinking to myself, all right, here's someone who went and never became a historian, but is able to apply the lessons that they learned as, a, as an undergraduate history major throughout, the, not just in their professional lives, but throughout their lives. Uh, so I was, I was impressed and I have to say I'm moved at, at that very opening juncture of reaching out to alums. Uh, we, I hung up the phone and thought, okay, nice guy, cool, I can move forward with my, my, um, my job as chair and do this kind of work. Little did I know that I'd be hearing from him again just a month or two later because I sent a note out to all of the alums of the history department, there are 14,000 or something of them. And in that note, I just gave a very brief sort of biographical statement on who I was. And it turns out that the person who was my mentor, my advisor as a graduate student, first in North Carolina and then in New York City, a man named Colin Palmer, was, uh, he, he, was, he became a PhD, he got his PhD here at UW. He's of Jamaican ancestry, actually. So he came here in the 1960s straight from Jamaica. He has an interesting story on his own right. But the person who was his roommate was Michael Kaplan. <laughs> So I sent out this note, and Michael calls me back the next week and says, hey, you're never going to believe this, but my, you know, Colin was my roommate. And I was like, what? And so it, it, this is a strange set of coincidences. And what it did is it started a conversation that's continued all the way to the present day. We've stayed in touch. Uh, and the way that this lecture sh came to pass was in, in the conversation with Michael, I learned a lot about you know, his own personal interests. And one of the things he does is he, um, he goes to Hungary on a yearly basis, and has done so for a number of years. Uh, and engages in counseling, um, particularly alcohol and substance abuse counseling in Hungary. Um, but he also has family there, and I think that's what's, that's what's drawn him back. I mean, it's the family connections, um, and particularly in the Jewish community in, in Hungary. And so this, this is a topic that has been near and dear to him for a very long time. And so it was sort of the combination of the inspiration of his own life trajectory and the conversations we had that, that he, he asked me, he said, look, would you mind uh, sponsoring some kind of talk that's focused on, on uh, you know, the Holocaust in Hungary? And I was like, absolutely, be happy to. So then I consulted my colleagues who know better, better about these things than I do. Uh, and we pulled this together, but it would not have happened, A, without the sort of inspiration, the intellectual inspiration of Michael Kaplan, and then also the donation. I mean, he made a healthy donation in order to make this happen. Um, 
I guess for me, for those of you who hear me talk on these topics, and some of you probably hear me talk on them ad nauseum, and I apologize, uh, but Michael is exactly the type of intellectually engaged alum um, who is an also incidentally a donor, but um, who, who inspires, I think all of them, I mean, certainly me, it's one of the privileges of being chair, inspires me to, to go out and be the, the very best teacher and the very best researcher that I possibly can be because, you know, that engagement with people like him expands our intellectual circle every day and brings it back to this campus in ways that I think we, we oftentimes as faculty member, members underestimate. So my, my biggest thank you is to Michael Kaplan. Thank you. And now I'll turn this over to Catherine Fiancia, who will say some profound things. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Siancia. I am an assistant professor of East European history here in the history department at UW. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Paul Hannebrink. Paul comes to us from Rutgers University, uh, where he is an associate professor of history and Jewish studies. He began working there in 2001. Um, after he gained his PhD from the University of Chicago, just up the road from us. He also served for six years as the director of, for the Institute for Hungarian Studies at Rutgers. He was the director of the Hungarian Studies Association from 2009 to 2011. And just recently, he became a member of the academic committee at the United States Holocaust Memorial Council in Washington, DC. Paul's first book, In Defense of Christian Hungary, Religion, Nationalism, and Antisemitism in Hungary, 1890 to 1944, was published in 2006. In this book, he makes an important intervention in the fields of East European and Hungarian history by reinserting the importance of religion, and particularly the roles of the Catholic and Protestant churches in the development of modern antisemitism. Essentially, he shows us how Hungary moved from a liberal definition of the nation in the late 19th century um, to the idea of Christian Hungary um, and the exclusion from which Jews were largely excluded. And this particularly happened at the end of the First World War, um, which was uh, very traumatic for the Hungarian nation. Building on the exploration of these themes, he's currently at work on a new book, which has the working title, A Spectre Haunting Europe, The Idea of Judeo-Bolshevism in 20th Century Europe. This project seeks to explore the powerful myth that was prevalent across Europe, not only in Hungary, that all Jews were involved in international plots of Bolshevism. And I think as the title suggests, the book will be of interest to scholars, not just on Hungary, but people who work on Europe in the 20th century. He's also published articles on Islam, how that fits in with this concept of Christian Hungary, and most recently on the politics of Holocaust memory in Hungary too. It's on that latter topic that he'll be speaking with us today. And the title of this talk, as you see behind you, it, behind me is the German Occupation Monument in Hungary, Holocaust Memory and the Problem of Double Occupation. We are delighted that he is here to speak with us today to share his expertise. Um, and Im it, importantly, because this is a really key year in uh, the commemoration of the Holocaust, because it marks the 70th anniversary of the deportation of Hungary's Jews to Auschwitz. So without further ado, um, please join me in warm warmly welcoming Paul Hannebrink. War One Europe. From the mid-1930s onward, Hungary drew ever closer to Germany, a strategy that paid off after the start of the Second World War in German-brokered negotiations that returned some of the lost territories to Hungary. To cement this alliance, Hungary joined Nazi Germany in declaring war on the Soviet Union in June 1941. Just a few maps. This is a map of Nazi uh, do, uh, dominated Europe in 1942, and you can see that here Hungary is an ally or dependent state, according to the map. This map comes from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, this is a map to just sort of represent how much territory was lost uh, to Hungary after World War I, and the recovery of all of these pieces that have been detached was the central strategic concern of all Hungarian governments. Uh, from that point forward, and this is what alliance with Germany was, uh, uh, the, the fruits of that alliance. You can see that during World War II, uh, this is Hungary, both before World War II and also after it, 
Uh, this is not the entirety of all the territories lost after World War I, but it is something, and it was uh, an encouragement to many Hungarians to see the alliance as fruitful and to continue because perhaps after a war which Germany won, Hungary might get even more territory back. Of course, not all of Hungary's political leaders were enthusiastic about this partnership, especially after the tide of the war began to turn. A few, including the prime minister from 1942 to 1944, wanted to hold the Nazi regime at arm's length while they waited for the best moment to break away. But much of Hungarian society, including the vast majority of the country's social elite, most members of the ruling government party, and nearly all of the country's military leaders, celebrated the German alliance and cooperated closely with their partners in Berlin. Among themselves, German military personnel acknowledged the good relations they enjoyed with Hungary. When the German general Maximilian von Weichs, commander of the force dispatched to occupy Hungary, was asked how long the occupation would take, he replied 24 hours. Astounded, his interviewer asked, well, what would happen if there were any resistance? Weichs' answer, in that case, 12 hours, they could forego all the Hungarian welcome speeches. The German army committed no massacres as it took up new positions inside Hungary. Uh, instead, Wehrmacht staff immediately began working closely with Hungarian experts to coordinate the wartime economy more closely with Germany's. Meanwhile, General Weichs complained in his diary of boredom, <laughs> with little to occupy him except dinners, wine tastings, and evenings at the opera. <laughs> Second. The Hungarian government that was formed immediately after the occupation cannot be accurately described as a puppet government. It is true that the Gestapo arrested the prime minister and the interior minister, both known anti-Nazis. But their replacements, enthusiastic pro-Nazis, were members of the highest social elite. One had been a minister in a previous Hungarian government. Neither were political outsiders by any stretch of the imagination. A number of ministers of the preoccupation government transitioned smoothly into the new cabinet. Hungary's head of state, the regent Miklos Horthy, sanctioned the new government after intense negotiations with the Germans about its composition before he withdrew temporarily from politics. His act made the new government legal in a constitutional sense. Only much later, in October of 1944, after the regent and a small group of political allies tried to pull Hungary out of the war, did the German occupiers replace the entire cabinet with a true puppet government, led by members of the fascist Arrow Cross Party. And during their few months in power, Arrow Cross thugs were undoubtedly brutal, towards Jews especially, but also towards anyone who seemed to question their authority. Their reign was widely seen as illegitimate and few bothered to heed their commands in the chaotic weeks of January and February 1945 when the Red Army laid siege to Budapest. But the Arrow Cross, the fascist Arrow Cross, played no role whatsoever in the German occupation of Hungary commemorated by the new monument on Freedom Square. Third, Jewish Hungarians were targeted for discrimination by their own government well before the 19th of March, 1944. Already in 1920, Hungarian legislators approved Europe's first post-war anti-Jewish law, a law that set quotas on the number of Jews who could enroll at university. In a backlash against Hungary's defeat in war, the loss of so much territory, as well as the chaos caused by a Bolshevik revolutionary regime that ruled in Hungary for four and a half months. The intensity of official anti-Semitism varied according to the political climate, but Hungary's extreme right consistently pushed for a more thorough solution to what they saw as the country's Jewish question. As Hungary drew closer to Nazi Germany in the 1930s, their position grew stronger, and they pressured successive Hungarian governments to enact several more anti-Jewish laws. Two, in 1938 and 1939, placed ever greater restrictions on Jewish participation 
in the country's economic and cultural and social life. Another, in 1941, defined Jews by race much like the Nuremberg Laws and banned mixed marriages between Christians and Jews. In addition, after 1939, the Hungarian government forbade Jewish men of service age from serving in the army and compelled them instead to serve in labor service battalions. The experiences of Jews in these labor battalions varied considerably. Some found relatively decent conditions in units commanded by humane officers, but most others were treated brutally by commanders who were rabid anti-Semites. By 1944, over 10,000 men had died in these forced labor units. Finally, in August 1941, Hungarian authorities deported some 17,000 people over the border of northeastern Hungary into German-occupied Ukraine, where almost all were killed by the Einsatzgruppen group and shooting squads. In theory, this was a police action against so-called illegal aliens from Poland. In practice, Hungarian authorities rounded up a great many Jews who had never known another home. Ministry officials prevented further similar deportations, but even so, the action reflects the zeal with which Hungarian bureaucrats and security officers hope to segregate and expel people defined as non-Hungarians, above all Jews. Thus, the German occupation on the 19th of March, 1944, intensified government anti-Jewish policy dramatically, but it most certainly did not create it. Fourth, and finally, the genocide of Hungarian Jews could not have occurred without the active participation of Hungarians in all walks of life. Adolf Eichmann and his aides arrived in Budapest in March 1944 to begin plans for the deportation of Hungary's Jews to Auschwitz. Despite having a staff of only perhaps 200, Eichmann immediately began to work with Hungarian officials to identify Hungary's Jews, segregate them into ghettos, and then force them onto trains to the death camp in Poland. In this way, some 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported from Hungary to Auschwitz within the space of perhaps 10 weeks, from mid-May to early July 1944, when Hungary's regent halted the deportations. This was possible only because the Hungarian civil service was so meticulous in enforcing the various anti-Jewish decrees that came down like a hailstorm in the weeks following the German occupation, and because the Hungarian police and gendarmerie were so brutal in enforcing the ghettoization and entrainment of their Jewish neighbors. Gendarmes routinely seized the possessions of Jews whom they forced onto trains and submitted those whom they thought were rich to humiliating personal searches. Their zeal impressed even Adolf Eichmann, who remarked to a member of the Budapest Judenrat that, quote, we would never have managed so well without them. All of this paved the way for a massive redistribution of Jewish property, a policy long anticipated and eagerly awaited and welcomed by Hungarians of all social classes. As trains left Hungary's provincial towns and villages for Auschwitz, local people looted the homes and shops of the Jews now gone. Meanwhile, government offices began to redistribute Jewish property and assets to the well-connected. In sum, many non-Jewish Hungarians took part in the state-sponsored plunder of Jewish Hungarians, a fact that has only recently begun to receive the historical attention that it deserves. And if I could present you with just two pictures to represent where the thrust of the really good empirical work on the Holocaust in Hungary is, it would be these two pictures. The first one uh, is of a small town where Hungarian gendarmes, who are kind of like sheriffs, a sort of provincial police force, are ordering Jews from a, one particular small town south of Budapest called Scholtvodkert uh, onto trains. And the, for our purposes, most striking thing about this photograph is the absence anywhere in the photograph of any Germans. Uh, these are Hungarian gendarmes carrying this out uh, on their own. The second 
which has been the uh, subject of a tremendous amount of really good uh, research, has shown just how widespread the participation is in the looting. And this kind of photograph uh, is, I think, indicative of the results and the fruits of that labor. It just shows that uh, looting of Jewish property was popular among all classes, regions, uh, age groups uh, of uh, Hungarian society. Uh, and in, in some ways, digesting these two photographs uh, is really at the heart of figuring out where to put the Holocaust in modern Hungarian history. This woman, of course, undoubtedly had no particular ideological point of view, uh, but she certainly uh, knew when there was uh, stuff to be had. And uh, she was undoubtedly encouraged to take it by uh, a tremendous amount of rhetoric that had been around for a long time saying that uh, Jews had wealth uh, because they had gotten it illegitimately. Uh, so these two pictures are sort of at the, at the heart of what is not said by the monument. Uh, to be fair, uh, the supporters of the new occupation monument are quite right about one thing. The deportation of hundreds of thousands of Jewish Hungarians to Auschwitz would not have happened if the Germans had not occupied Hungary on the 19th of March, 1944. But decades of research into the diplomatic, political, and social history of Hungary by historians there and abroad have shown clearly that the history of the Holocaust in Hungary does not begin or end with that simple fact. German occupation was a necessary condition for the genocide of Jewish Hungarians. It was not a sufficient condition. And yet the new occupation monument, memorial on Freedom Square ignores this established body of research and distorts or sanitizes the historical record. Why? The monument's true significance becomes clearer when we consider more carefully the claims of its builders that it is not about the Holocaust at all, but is instead a memorial to Hungary's lost sovereignty. This may be bad history, but it reflects very well the premises of Hungary's new political order. So I'd like to turn now to contemporary politics. In 2010, Hungarians held national elections. The results were nothing short of a political earthquake. The left liberal government that had ruled Hungary since 2002 was trounced. As voters gave Viktor Orban and the right-wing coalition dominated by his Fidesz party an overwhelming two-thirds majority in parliament. Immediately, the new government used its legislative supermajority to write a new constitution, which they ratified in 2011. The framers worked quickly. The principal author boasted of writing the final version on his iPad during a train trip from Brussels to Budapest. But they were thorough in their efforts to reshape Hungary's political landscape, including provisions that severely curtailed judicial independence and revised electoral regulations in the government's favor. They also wrote a preamble that declared the political and moral values on which the new order rested. In that remarkable text, readers can find statements such as, we recognize the role of Christianity in pre preserving nationhood, or we are proud of our forebears. But they will also find a powerful reinterpretation of modern Hungarian history. In a crucial passage in the preamble, the author, authors of the new constitution declare, quote, we date the restoration of our country's self-determination, which was lost on the 19th day of March, 1944, from the second day of May, 1990 when Hungary had its first free and fair post-communist elections. We shall consider this date, they continued, to be the beginning of our country's new democracy and constitutional order. In other places, the framers reject the suspension of what they call Hungary's historical constitution during the Nazi and Soviet occupation. In other words, the framers unilaterally eliminated 46 years, two months, and five days from Hungarian history. Only in May 1990 could the nation begin to revive the political traditions 
and restore the moral order that had lain dormant since March 19, 1944. At the same time, the framers explained the missing 46 years even as they bracketed them. The German occupation and the 45 years of Soviet rule that followed it were similar. Each regime was a different aspect of the same tyranny that stripped Hungary of its right to self-determination for nearly half a century. Each had robbed the nation of its collective agency and made it a victim. Both were totalitarian. The framers drew their own lesson from this history. And I quote, after the decades of the 20th century, which led to a state of moral decay, we have an abiding need for spiritual and intellectual renewal. All of this is verbatim from the Constitution. Post-communist renewal had in fact long been a project of Hungary's right. When the communist regime disintegrated in 1990, anti-communist nationalists searched for historical models as they tried to reestablish the right in a society where it had been absent for over 40 years. After 1994, the Fidesz party, led by Viktor Orban, continued these efforts as the largest right-wing party. For them, the years between 1919 and 1944, the so-called Horthy regime, named after the regent during those years, Admiral Miklos Horthy, seemed an eminently usable past. After all, the regime that governed Hungary from 1919 to 1944 had been explicitly anti-communist and counter-revolutionary from its inception. Conservative nationalists also admired the interwar years as an era when the country's political leaders had cooperated closely with the Christian churches on cultural and educational policy. Even more important, the interwar era had been a time of intense nationalism, as a broad spectrum of Hungarian society yearned to restore the country's historic borders and debated issues of national destiny with passion and fervor. Of course, the details of these matters had changed dramatically between 1944 and 1990. Still, the spirit in which they had been discussed struck a chord with those trying to rebuild the right in Hungary. The collapse of communism also made it possible, at long last, to discuss the now-vanished regime openly. During the communist era, the party state had always described the arrival of Soviet troops in Hungary as liberation from fascism. The monument to the Red Army, erected on Freedom Square in 1946, reads honor to the liberating Soviet heroes. For Jews in Budapest in the early months of 1945, the Red Army did undoubtedly bring liberation. But few others could accept this statement as anything other than ironic. All Hungarians commemorated the uprising in 1956 as a national revolution, even if they disagreed about its larger meaning. But the collapse of communism allowed Hungarians to talk about other aspects of communist rule such as the victims of forced labor camps run as prisons by the Communist Party, or the many people wrongfully arrested, tried, convicted, and sometimes executed by the Hungarian secret police, the AVO. Or, even more slowly and much more painfully, the mass rape of Hungarian women by Red Army soldiers in 1945. After 1990, Hungarians also began to ask themselves how the communist regime had remained stable for so long. The party had conferred advantages and professional advancement to those who joined or supported it. Was it correct then to say that Hungarians had collaborated with the regime? Could Hungary be a truly post-communist society if many of the country's leading figures in finance, civil administration, and higher education had all risen to their posts with the blessing of the party? In short, had 1989 really been the change that everyone said it was. Throughout the 1990s, and I'll take this monument away, uh, the Renaissance right, led, as I said, after 1994 by Viktor Orban and the Fidesz party, 
fought a fierce battle for political power with the Hungarian left, comprised of the restructured and renamed former communist, now socialist party, and a much smaller group of liberal ex-dissidents who called themselves Free Democrats. In 1994, the left was voted into power. In 1998, the right replaced them. And in 2002, the left again won national elections. Amid this political turbulence, left liberal critics, a mix of public intellectuals and politicians, developed a powerful critique of the new conservative nationalism that animated their rivals. They warned that sifting through the interwar years for a usable past and embracing the symbolism and the rhetoric of those years threatened to revive the anti-Semitic and illiberal politics that had made the 1944 Holocaust in Hungary possible. By distorting the historical record, the right was deliberately scuttling the country's long overdue efforts to confront its troubled past. For these critics, confronting the legacy of the Holocaust in their own country was a necessary act of moral reconciliation, but also a powerful political statement. They recognized the Holocaust had become an internationally acknowledged reference point for liberal political norms and human rights awareness, not least within the official culture of the European Union. So for this reason, the country's ability to confront its past would determine how, quote unquote, European Hungary would be in the new post-communist Europe. The prospects for cultural pluralism and democratic values in Hungary, the future of Hung Hungary's Europeanness, depended, they insisted, on the nation's commitment to Holocaust memory. The nationalist right dismissed this outright as politically correct demagogy. In a scathing 1998 essay, the historian Maria Schmidt, a longtime ally and historical advisor to Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party, accused the left of raising what she called the phantom menace of anti-Semitism whenever it was out of power and then declaring it contained whenever they were back in government. Amidst this year's controversy over the occupation memorial, Government supporters once again accuse their critics of hypocritical political correctness. Again, Maria Schmidt is at the center of the debate. In a D July 2014 article, she accused critics of what she called, quote, selective sensitivity. The 20th century, she argued, had been, quote, rich in tragedies. But critics of the government only had sympathy for one of them, the Holocaust. In the very same square as the new monument, there still stood the 1946 memorial to the Red Army, which commemorated, as she put it, quite pointedly, invading Soviet soldiers who raped more than 100,000 Hungarian women while pillaging and terrorizing the country. Why, she asked, were left liberal champions of democracy and Holocaust memory not organizing, quote, flash mob protests of that memorial? Part of the answer Mario Schmidt insinuated, had to do with the identity of the government's critics. We are at a point, she wrote, where some groups would like to consider their ancestors' tragic fate an inheritable and advantageous privilege. They prescribe empathy, then close their hearts, remaining deaf and blind to the pain of others. And so, because they act as if our national mourning can have no palliative effect on tragedies past, they exclude themselves from our national community. In her essay, Schmidt named no names. But her lines referred to the openly acknowledged fact that some of the most prominent and outspoken left liberal public intellectuals in Hungary are Jews. And in fact, Holocaust survivors are descendants of them. Schmidt only sharpened her innuendo when she described her left liberal opponents with adjectives that certainly have a long history, uh, cosmopolitan, internationalist, and flat-out anti-nation. Quite rightly outraged by this attack, one historian, Maria Kovac, who was, I think, in the department here in uh, Madison for a time in the 1990s, 
uh, Maria Kovacs responded in print by calling Schmidt's words a, quote, declaration of war. Outrageous though it was, Schmidt's robust defense of the occupation monument reflects very well the relative importance that those shaping Hungary's new political culture assign to the Holocaust. Balance, they insist, can only be struck through comparison. The 20th century was filled with horrors. One of Maria Schmidt's important essays from the late 1990s was called Holocausts, plural, in the 20th century. Hungarians should consider the impact that each of these had on their national history. In this spirit, intellectuals like Schmidt, who are close to the Fidesz government, embrace Western debates about totalitarianism, precisely because treating Nazism and communism as two types of totalitarian rule provides a way to think about both of them together. Totalitarianism theory is also attractive because scholars who employ it typically focus on the ways in which the party state repressed and dominated a passive society. Translating this into the Hungarian context, conservative historians take this as license to blame German occupiers and the relatively small number of Hungarian fascists who openly modeled themselves on the National Socialist Party for crimes committed against Jews. Finally, the Hungarian right applauds when some Western scholars, taking stock of communism's legacy after 1989, say that its evils have not been sufficiently appreciated by leftist intellectuals. In Hungary's polarized political climate, the right finds this an accurate description of the post-communist left. For all these reasons, the theory of totalitarianism, of double occupation, as you will, if you will, allows the nationalist right in Hungary to transform Holocaust memory from a moral project that promotes pluralism and civil rights into a prelude to a deeper examination of communist crimes. For conclusion, I will give you both monuments together. The new memorial to the German occupation thus stands as a riposte to the Red Army Monument on the other end of Freedom Square. Announced as a sign that Hungary can finally tell long suppressed truths, the 2014 memorial nevertheless derives a great part of its symbolic meaning and gravitas from that earlier 1946 monument. Each reflects the aesthetic style of its builders. The Red Army Monument is a classic example of Soviet anti-fascism. Massive, earnest, and imposing in its demand for reverence in the face of heroism. The new monument at the other end of the square is very different. Its style can really only be described as kitsch. It does not venerate heroes. It demands pity instead for victims. But if the scene of a savage eagle attacking a helpless angel brings tears to any eyes, it does so cheaply. Who exactly are the victims? How did they become victims? Who really are the victimizers? The memorial has no answer to these complex questions because it does not bother to ask them. It is perhaps worth mentioning in closing that the Hungarian government has now announced plans for a new Holocaust museum, which will be called the House of Fates. Given that its director will be Mario Schmidt, and that its exhibition will focus on children killed during the Holocaust, I think it very unlikely that this unfortunately named museum will do very much to correct the historical distortions represented by the occupation memorial or to encourage a more critical interpretation of the past. There is instead every reason to believe they will treat the Holocaust, Hungarian Holocaust much as the new monument in Freedom Square does. A tragedy worthy of our sorrow, but one ultimately tangential to Hungary's struggle for national self-determination in a totalitarian age. Thank you. Parallels as I've observed between uh, the Hungarian.
Hungarian situation and that in the Baltic countries, except for the fact that the Baltic countries also had an additional period of Soviet occupation uh, during the first years of World War II. I mean, because I know there's the same controversies like in Estonia, of yeah. monuments to the Red Army. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, in, in one way or another, you can find these kind of debates going on with different intensity in every country that had been part of the former East Bloc. Um, in every country there is, there is a group of people who want to have some kind of museum or memorial or some kind of commemorative practices about the Holocaust, specifically which takes into account the destruction of the Jewish communities in that society. And then there is another much larger, usually linked to uh, more powerful political parties, who want to uh, talk about the relationship of Nazi occupation to Soviet occupation, to see both of these as somehow entwined in some kind of, 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 of thing. And so the Baltics are, are a very good example of this, but you can find the same kind of debate uh, in any number of other countries. I'm sure Catherine could find uh, parallels to this in Poland and so forth. So, yes. This one. Well, mm, it would be uh, late spring, early summer, 1944. Beyond that, I can't tell you. I, I, is the Hungarian situation different? I don't recall in, in other places where there was looting in ghettos, which would have resulted in uh, you know, walking with great deals of love. Well, there, I mean, there were lootings in, in, in ghettos, uh, in, in, in emptied out ghettos in many, pretty much everywhere where there were ghettos. Um, the timing of Hungary is, is, of course, very different from elsewhere in, in, in East, uh, Eastern and East Central Europe insofar as there, apart from one or two isolated instances, there were no deportations from Hungary until 1944. So all of this happens in a very compressed period of time. This kind of scene would take place in uh, Poland or the occupied Soviet Union a few years earlier. But you could see the same instance of people going through places where the Jewish inhabitants had been deported from and trying to see what they could find. But uh, the way in which you presented might, you know, could, could be a very different interpretation from that, what actually is going on. I mean, what do you mean? Well, I mean, it was sort of in the context that, you know, that uh, there was a very widespread uh, participation you know, in, in uh, the Holocaust, I'm, I'm part of Hungary, so they were very actively involved. But, you know, that this was all very popular for them. Uh, and that may, may be the case, but unless we know the time, and, and, and you know, perhaps, perhaps this is very close to the, to the, to the uh, liberation and the, 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 the need just to find something to live on. Well, I mean, we can't tell anything from this photograph of what, it, what this woman is actually thinking about. Um, that's for sure. But what we do know is this photograph was taken. Um, it's been authenticated. Um, in uh, uh, probably, I would say, June or so of 1944. Uh, and it is uh, one of the ghettos in, um, uh, in Hungary that was established. Um, they existed for a much shorter period of time in Hungary than elsewhere, for example, in Poland. But they existed for sometimes a couple of weeks, sometimes a little bit longer than that. And she is gathering possessions from that place to take them home. I mean, that's all we, we know from a photograph. Um, but that already is something, it seems to me. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for fascinating talk. Um, so you well described how uh, the present day Hungarian political scene is polarized between um, the socialists who are descended mostly from the communists um, and the right wing of Viktor Orban. Um, do you see any alternatives to those two parties, to those two, um, I would say, groups? Yeah. Do you see um, a left wing um, political group emerging who are not, uh, who don't have communist origins and who have more critical interpretation of the Soviet past? And on the other hand, do you see a right wing group emerging who, is, who would be more critical of the Nazi past and the Hungarian involvement in? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, you know, there, there's, there's a great hope on the part of many people in Hungary and outside it of, you know, some kind of different political constellation. Uh, there have been uh, all kinds of hopes that somehow on the right, a kind of Christian Democratic Party that looks like what you have in Germany would emerge. Uh, it hasn't so far, precisely because um, the Fidesz Party has become such a powerful and very effective political machine. It's really sucked up anybody with any sort of 
other ideas of what the right wing might be and either completely marginalized them or included them into the machine. So they have a very wide patronage network. Um, on the other side, you know, I would say the, the, the very small party um, of free Democrats actually had a much more complicated view of the communist past uh, than the people in the Socialist Party did. And I think one of the real tragedies is that they got lumped into and because of the political situation forced to work very closely with the Socialists, even though that wasn't actually the kind of intellectual trajectory of many members of that small party. Um, since they were pretty much destroyed in 2010, there's been the hope that there might be some other sort of different left-wing party, but uh, so far it's very small groups of people based primarily in Budapest with absolutely no sense of popular touch or how modern politics actually works. Um, and I don't really see at this point any of them being viable in any kind of way. So that would be the hope, but at this moment I don't, I don't see it. Uh, yes? Hi, two questions. First, did anyone make explicit comment criticism of the fact that the arch archangel was explicitly Christian? You know, a Christian symbol yeah. for Hungary. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that has been also part of it. And, you know, the Constitution <laughs> talks about Christianity and nationalism uh, going together very nice. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that came, came in. And also, you know, it's, it's, people have pointed out that while it's not explicitly so, uh, nonetheless, the gesture is somewhat, you know, on a cross crucified. Um, and so there is definitely a, you know, it just enhances the sort of the, 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 the helpless victim, the innocent victim being victimized by a force of evil that comes from outside. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I guess this is a larger question mm. that I keep thinking about. I've seen the Austrian memorial, which is about the victims of the bombing of that particular apartment. You know, so where you take the victims of the Holocaust uh, in Austria, and you also take victims. Mm -hmm. It was built, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's built, it's built on a, a piece of land where there used to be a large uh, apartment house mm -hmm. where many people died during the German bombings. Right. So what it does is it leads the difference between the Austrians as victims and the Jews as yeah. victims, okay? Um, so in some ways it's the opposite mm -hmm. of what you're talking about, which is it doesn't attempt to separate the Holocaust from, right. you know, the memorial of the war. So there's that, but then uh, there's also Berlin, you know, where you have very similar um, circumstances in terms of, a, you know, if not a double occupation and a double regime, a Nazi mm -hmm. one and a communist one, 1989 coming out of that and then constructing you know, the memorial for the murder of the Jews, right in the center of Berlin, which is an extremely effective mm -hmm. um, memorial, which has been really globally embraced. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm wondering, you know, which, why it is that some countries are able to come to terms with these very complicated occupations and pasts, and, and some are not. I mean, <coughs> why Germany but not Hungary? And I, I don't know if that's an answerable question, yeah. but the, co the contrast is really striking. Well, I mean, I, you know, I guess all I can really say is that there's been a very long period of time in which um, Holocaust memory has been brought to the center of, you know, German public consciousness. And um, there was no discussion of it at all, um, really between about 1948 until 1989. You can see maybe the first glimmers of it in the very last years of the communist period, but that, they're only glimmers. Um, and you know, second, I think it relates back to the earlier question about somehow finding a um, a way to talk about multiple catastrophes simultaneously. I mean, what the right is talking about. I mean, some of the things that Maria Schmidt says are, are you know, they're, they're actually facts. You can decide for yourself how relevant they are. But you know, it is true that the Red Army, uh, you know, the 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 rate of uh, mass rape that happens in Hungary is very similar to what happens in Germany. Um, it's also true that during World War II, the um, you know loss of of of, of life of, among Hungarian soldiers fighting you know in this doomed alliance on the on the Eastern Front um, it affects many many families. And, and an entire army is destroyed on the dawn in 1943, which is something that many people have you know family memories of. And so that somehow was never discussed either. 
during the communist period. And so some, there are all of these things that are out there. And um, what seems to be impossible in Hungary is to come up with some way about speaking about all of them in some way that um, takes into account the gravity of each of them. Um, that somehow to talk about what happened to Hungarian soldiers or to talk about some of these other things means that you have to marginalize the Holocaust uh, through comparison. Um, and that's the phenomenon that I think I'm wrestling with, but it's a very widespread one that you see not only in Hungary but in other countries of the region. Um, do you know to what extent anti-Semitism in Hungary might have been augmented by the excesses of the Bela Kuhn regime in 1919? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's uh, the kind of thing that the right brings up all the time now. Um, and they would go so f they would actually add to what you say. They would say, look, um, uh, Bela Kuhn was Jewish. Uh, so was Matyas Rakoshi uh, you know, after 1945. So were those communists in the early Stalinist years. And so all of this, you know, creates this, um, you know, powerful sort of energy-laden antipathy to communism that has an anti-Semitic edge. And it's therefore understandable. Um, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's, it's taken as an explanation by the right. And yet once you sort of start to dig into it, you realize that actually the history of anti-Semitism doesn't just start in 1919 in Hungary. It has an older, uh, a much older history. And, and so there is a kind of a language uh, already in place, a way of seeing and interpreting phenomenon, social historical phenomenon, that um, is already usable by, for people in 1919 and 1920 to say, well, this is a Jewish revolution. And then that kind of gets inscribed into the way in which many nationalists think about 1919. So it's, I mean, I, I, I hope that doesn't seem to, it's a kind of a recursive thing that actually has its roots in something that's prior to the revolution. Um, over here and then over there, yeah. This is somewhat related to the first question. I was wondering if there was ever any discussion of removing the Soviet monument. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And the more I, as I was working on this parallel, I, I asked myself, why is it still there? It would seem to be um, of particular symbolic importance. Yeah, and, 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 and I, so I, I tried to do some research, and I think it will take even more. Um, it's, it's interesting that it's still there precisely because the Hungarians were so good about basically removing any other statue. Uh, from Budapest and putting them out in a very kind of interesting Disney kind of like park called Statue Park on the far outskirts <laughs> of the city. And you can go there and you can see like 40 Lenins and a bunch of other. And it's really, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, but, but this one stayed. Uh, and the, the only explanation that I can find so far, and again, I haven't, I don't know, I don't even know if there would be access that you could get into the archives that would give you a better answer is that um, the Russians are very much invested in having that monument still there. And the Hungarian government, um, for all of their, you know, we liberating ourselves from communism, uh, is still economically very much dependent on Russia, uh, and even more so today. Uh, so the presence of that monument, uh, you know, is some way of sort of keeping that relationship sort of uh, intact and usable, and that removing it would jeopardize it. Um, that's all I have for you right now. That's clearly part of it. I don't know if it's all of it, but it's clearly part of it. Way back there, Juliana. Um, thank you so much. This was really fascinating and, and disturbing. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. I was going to ask the same question, but I have a few more questions for you. Um, so one is, I'm um, um, happy we still have this image up here. I wanted to ask you to um, reflect a little bit about another feature of this monument, which I find really interesting, which is the neoclassicism. Yeah. And um, what I'm guessing is an attempt to, um, in, to kind of uh, tell a specifically Western Christian story about <laughs> Hungarian history. So I'm curious to hear you talk about, um, about that and whether um, Fidesz has ex explicitly um, try to tie Hungarian history to a kind of Greco-Roman past. The other question that I had was about whether um, kind of the place that these monuments you expect will have in the living tradition of uh, Budapest as a city, will there be um, kind of warring commemorations uh, taking place or does the 1946 monument kind of 
hang out in its enormous and imposing way in the square, but not is, is it not really part of the, the living traditions of the city, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. I'll take the first one. Um, I haven't read any discussion of the, 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 the neoclassical features, which you're very right are there, the pillars, the, you know, the sort of uh, you know, thing on the top. Um, uh, I will say that it, you know, in Hungary, the, 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 the real tide of the Western tradition comes from the conversion of the Hungarians to Christianity. And so there's not any celebration. There's no Greek, Greco Roman past to, to celebrate. But nonetheless, you know, that's always a nice feature of, of anyone's involvement in the West. And so um, I think that's probably why they chose it. I don't think this, as I said, this architect is not you know, known to be a particularly subtle or aesthetically distinguished person. So I don't know that he had any grand conception beyond, well, you know, it's there in the Parthenon, so why don't we have it too? Um, but, you know, that's probably why he chose it. Um, the thing about the afterlife is, is, is really very interesting. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, the, the easy answer is to say we'll have to see. I mean, what is interesting about the Soviet monument is that before 2010, when the left was in power, the police did actually have to put a, a barrier around that Soviet occupation, uh, the Soviet monument, um, because there were many, many uh, uh, far-right neo-Nazi groups who said that it was a shame and it should be destroyed. Um, I was therefore very interested when I was there in June uh, to find that, let me go back to it, uh, whoops, no, I can't, oops, sorry about that. Um, I was very interested, no, it's gone. Um, I was very interested to find that it was not only not surrounded by a fence, but in fact had been cleaned. Um, it actually looks very nice now and is thoroughly ignored by everyone who walks by it. Uh, the German occupation memorial, of course, is now the site of all of these protests. It gets all of these, you know, detention. There are objects placed. Police are there. Um, you know, it's, it's getting all of the attention. Um, whether the German occupation memorial can somehow become normalized so that it just becomes a place where kids skateboard, I don't know. Um, I think it will be some time. And I think that has to do with the fact that there are, there are just too many competing interpretations of the Holocaust in Hungary right now. When this museum gets built, that I mentioned at the end, that Maria Schmidt will be the director of this so-called House of Fates, um, it will be one of two Holocaust, specifically Holocaust museums in Budapest, each of which has a completely different conception from the other. There is currently right now, there's actually a, there's a, there's a, not even yet another museum. There's one museum called the House of Terror that makes this comparison between Nazism and communism very clearly. Then there's another museum that uh, up until very recently I would have said was actually a very good one uh, called the Holocaust Documentation Center. Uh, which has a very excellent, thoroughly scholarly researched uh, permanent exhibition. It was very creative in its temporary exhibitions uh, with a lot of very good scholars associated with it whose position, I, I understand from talking with a number of them, has become ever more precarious of, of recently. So what the long-term future of that museum is, I don't know. But as of when I was last there, it's a very good one. I would wholeheartedly endorse it. And then this new one, which is, seems to be about... Um, Sad stories about children deported to Poland. Uh, so that will, if it is built, and I think it will be because the money's there, um, that will be yet another vision of the Holocaust. And I think with so many things in the air, it's very hard to imagine when a future when this German mo monument will just be a thing that people walk past and throw chewing gum at. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick follow-up question to that: Do you know anything about whether this new museum will also um, present? Christians as victims too? I suspect that it will, but I don't know for sure because the government is keeping a lot of it very, they tend to like to keep things close to their vest until they're ready to go and then they do it really quickly and then it's there. So um, they're not going to have any public debate about it. Um, the director did try to go around and canvas um, historians outside of the country. I know that uh, she contacted people like Istvan Dayak said, will you somehow be involved with the board? Everyone has said no. Um, so we don't really know that much. But I, you know, we know who the director is, and we know uh, something about the conception, and that's enough to make me nervous about it anyway. Uh, here. Does Carlo Vincente have any role in the thinking of the right wing here? Uh, 
Well, you know what's interesting is, I mean, obviously he's a he's a he's a hero to them. He's a you know a martyr uh, to Kanye, but he hasn't come up very much in these discussions precisely because there's so much to be chewed over during the years of World War II that, um, in a sense, 1956, which was the really hot thing in 1989, 1990, has gotten kind of pushed to the side because right now World War II occupies everyone's attention. So, as a result, Cardinal Mincenti is. Um, obviously revered as a national hero by the right, but gets less airtime. Uh, here, yes and no. There's a monument on the Elbe River in Germany put up by the Russians to commemorate the, the linkage between the Russian and American forces, and it uh, definitely emphasizes the Russians' uh, role in the whole situation. That's very interesting in design. I'll, I'd love to, to And I was in Berlin in May, and the Russian uh, liberation monument is still standing in the center of Berlin. Right. Um, I know that in Austria, in the interwar period, there was widespread feelings among all political uh, sectors that uh, the country was not viable as it was, you know, just a small remnant of the old empire. Um, was there a similar sentiment in uh, Hungary with regard to that? And would that have inspired feelings of? Uh, resentment or anti-Semitism? Um, I think that the, um, you know, uh, interwar Austria was famously described as a state that was left over after everything else was done. Um, you know, in Hungary it was much more a sense of um, a historic state that had existed for centuries had been carved up unjustly. And so the resentment was not about its viability but about its uh, mutilation. Uh, and so uh, rectifying that was the primary aim of, of everybody. I mean, left and right. I mean, basically everybody in Hungary sh thought that this was unjust uh, and wanted it corrected. So that was what drove uh, okay, the resentment. Yeah. Um, you showed that the Germans awarded large amounts of territory to uh, Hungary. Yes. Uh, didn't Hitler do something very similar as a tactic? Uh, after Czechoslovakia was dismembered, he offered some land to Poland around Teschen, and I think the Poles actually accepted it. A small piece of territory to, to Poland and a small strip of southern, what is today southern Slovakia, went back to Hungary. So um, the breakup of Czechoslovakia was one of several moments where Hungary got its territory back, which was, you know, tremendously encouraging for the Hungarian government and made them think, well, this, we made it, we placed the right bet. We backed the right horse. Yeah, yeah so I, that was very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the photos that you showed yeah. earlier. I don't know if you can get them back. Um, <laughs> of, the, um, of the things that people were leaving at, the, at this monument in protest. And this may be a very difficult question to answer, but I wondered if from being there, you had a sense of who these people were who were leaving these things, these shoes, these photographs, all the things yeah. that you showed us. And specifically, I wondered if there's a kind of generational element to this story. Um, you know, you talked about right and left. Um, but I, I'm sort of interested in, in the extent to which, you know, the young people mobilized yeah. against this monument, for this monument. How does, yeah. you know, just the generation that, that sort of mm -hmm. came of age after the end of communism, yeah. how do they feel about I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I was very struck. I went to, you know, one of these history teach-ins that was happening. and I, I went and watched some of the protests and heard some people speak. I was very struck by how intergenerational it was. Um, it was clear to me that, um, well, several things were clear to me. Uh, it was, you know, quite understandably, these, these things were happening every Monday. So, you know, um, it's not surprising, perhaps, that most of the people there seemed to me to be from Budapest. And you know, to what extent the protest has legs outside of the city of Budapest, I couldn't tell you. It's a different question. Um, but there were clearly a number of you know young people, clearly you know on the left, who had come of age after 1989, who were involved, uh, university students. Um, but there were also a lot of older people um, who had clearly, from their age, lived through a decent portion of the 20th century, who were there as well. Um, you know, I didn't, I'm not an oral historian, so I wasn't with my microphone going around. But, um, you know, I, I, think, I think that the, all of this protest against what the monument says about the Holocaust is very much tied to um, what people think about the current Hungarian government. And there is um, an intergenerational left that is 
numerically much smaller, but very, very impassioned now. And a monument like this will definitely galvanize them. Ah, yes. Oh, are you, can you compare Slavine in Bratislava and Poznan, or whatever you want to call it, how that Hungarian area and their Holocaust uh, monument, which is down at the end of the square, he has to Slav where the big synagogue was, you know, destroyed. And it seems to me that it's really insignificant and small compared to what it would have been. I, I don't, and, yeah. But slogging, it's huge and it's still there like here. I, I, don't know, I don't know that particular monument. What I will say is, um, you know, what is interesting is that the Hungarian government chose such a very prominent public place to make such a very big monument. I mean, this is clearly a very big statement that they wanted to make. Um, you know, there are other cases in the region where there is a very specifically Holocaust monument that is put off somewhere where nobody will see it. Um, this is a monument that is denied as being a Holocaust monument, but is in a very, very visible place. Um, on the same square, let us remember, is also the U.S. Embassy. So this is um, something that everyone will see. Yeah. Any other questions? No more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.